Okay, we're going to get started. I, I want to thank everybody who's here tonight. Um, this is our first, uh, our first uh, uh, attempt at presenting what we're very excited about in terms of a solution for our athletic fields needs in the Oyster River School District. Um, this has been a, a, a topic that's been a long time coming. Uh, this has been on the, uh, the, the, the front and or back burner of the Oyster River District for at least 17 years. Uh, there have been a number of incarnations of proposals that have been brought forward to the voters. Um, and we really feel very strongly that what we're about to present to you tonight is uh, the most uh, cost-effective and comprehensive solution that we can offer to the school district given a variety of variables that we have to work with. We're very excited about what we're about to share with you. Um, and we are hopeful that this uh, plan will come to fruition in March and we will then have uh, a, a state-of-the-art athletic facility for our, our Oyster River athletes and community members to take advantage of. Um, for uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Todd Allen. I'm the principal of Oyster River High School. Uh, to give you a little background on how I got involved in this issue, um, uh, prior to my being the principal here, I, I coached uh, middle school track and cross country for, for many years. Um, and the lack of an athletic, a, a track facility has always been something that has stood out as a, an obstacle to our really developing a, a really high performing and successful track program. We do have an amazing uh, track program, but obviously uh, having a home facility for us to compete on would, would go an awful long way to improving that condition for our kids. I have with me tonight uh, our athletic director, Corey Parker, um, and he is going to uh, kind of share a variety of uh, uh, insights with regards to the, uh, uh, the uh, athletic programs, the deficiencies in terms of our current situation. Um, and, uh, and we're also going to have a number of our coaches kind of talk a little bit about how they feel that their programs can benefit from this, this project. So the agenda for tonight is to really kind of run through, kind of explain um, the current situation that we're dealing with, what, um, what, what, what do we have for current athletic facilities. Um, we're then going to talk a little bit, of, a lot of people are maybe of the impression that doing nothing is, is a, a zero cost option and we will talk to you about you know, uh, what, it, what is involved in just doing what we're currently doing, because there's cost associated with that. Um, we are then going to share with you our very, what we consider to be a, an excellent comprehensive solution, and then we're going to talk timeline and really talk to you about how you can help us make this a reality. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Athletic Director Parker, who's going to talk a little bit about the current state of our athletic facilities. Thank you, Todd, and thank you, everyone, for making out this evening and to all the viewers at home. I briefly want to talk about the current state of our athletic programs. I thought it would be appropriate to break it down to a fall atmosphere as well as a spring atmosphere. So in the fall, and I've tried to outline it here within our um, Google map, if you will, of our facility, we really have three rectangular practice fields all made of grass, all consisted of year-round usage with spring and fall sports. So when you break it down, our need for additional space is extremely necessary. When you look at our current environment for games, it's very difficult to have a field hockey game or a unified soccer game taking place while a JV or a varsity game is happening at our facility. Between our field hockey field and our junior varsity soccer field, there's approximately two to three feet of space. And the reason that is, is we are trying to maximize the actual field dimensions um, necessary to be able to play a game on that area. Ha having said that, where we're really limited currently is because the amount of grass literally behind our high school on the facility out there. As you can see for soccer, which has six teams, we only have two soccer rectangles for them to practice on. In comparison to a lot of schools where they may have four fields, for teams of that magnitude. This becomes extremely difficult when talking about practices and coach preparation for those practices, and we'll have a coach here to address that in just a minute. Also from a concern, from a liability standpoint, obviously accessibility for fans and opposing teams to get to our venue. You can see the parking lot to the school, that is our main parking area for all our sporting events. As the building uh, on the far left of the picture, the facility building, only occupies about 16 to 18 spots, and those are being used by SAU employees. So to park 
you need to do it by the school and it becomes a tricky obstacle course to get to a varsity soccer game or to get to a lacrosse game or even a JV soccer game without conflicting and either going through it, another game happening or a practice venue that may be taking place. Um, at this time, Charlie Kroll, our boys soccer coach, is here and I wanted to call him up to address some of the concerns he has with our current facility and how an upgrade to the facility would be a great benefit to the boys soccer program in particular. So if I could have Charlie come up and then we'll have Sid Scarano of the girls program and the youth association. Maybe you both want to come up and kind of handle this together. JV coach at the um, high school, and um, I am also here representing the varsity coach this evening who could not make this meeting, but sent over some written comments that she asked me to read for the meeting. So I'll start with that. Our um, head coach, Linda Nelson, has been with the program for 20 years. Uh, she started out as the JV coach, and she has um, she now been our varsity coach for 15 or so years. Um, and this is what she would like our audience to know this evening. Um, preseason. The varsity field is always off limits for at least the first week of preseason as it recovers from the spring lacrosse season and the most recent years off limits for the entire preseason. And then in the most recent years has been off limits for the entire preseason. The boys and girls programs have to stagger the preseason training time so as to provide a large enough playing area to truly evaluate each player competing for a position on the teams. Our tryouts and preseason practices were held on the JV field, which is already very small compared to the varsity field, so space is still very limited. Players are standing on the sidelines waiting for turns to join in small sided matches as the field space is limited and full field scrimmages to evaluate players' ability to read the game and situational play has more than 50% of the players standing on the sidelines during tryouts. A turf field would allow immediate access on the first day of preseason. This past season, the first time we were actually able to play in the varsity field was the very first match. Anyone in sports understands the concept of home field advantage and how being unable to play on your field prior to a match minimizes the positives normally associated with home field advantage. A turf field would allow our players the opportunity to play on the surface prior to the first game and to provide ample time for the players to adjust to the playing field size and surface. Regular season. Excessive field usage between spring and fall sports seasons has really diminished the quality of our playing field. When I first started coaching the varsity team in 1994, the field was one of the best in the state. The turf was similar to professional quality with a reliable playing surface. Today, it is rough, unpredictable, and unplay unplayable during any type of heavy rain. I even question the safety of the field with regards to possible injuries from the unevenness of the grass with large gaps of grass missing by the end of the season. A turf field would improve our quality of play as the playing field would be more predictable and possibly reduce injuries caused by the uneven playing surface. As for planning practices, the varsity boys and girls have rotated schedules on Mondays and Tuesdays so that we may have full field practices. This works great unless there, are games in, unless there are games, in which case we are required to move to the 40 by 30 area located next to the softball diamond. In the fall, as the season progresses, the amount of daylight becomes a challenge with the alternating practice time. For example, our practice on Tuesdays toward the end of the season ended in darkness at 6.30 to 6.45. A turf field would enable our team to practice late into the season with lights, with lights, even the postseason when the clocks are turned back and it is dark by 4 p.m. The success of the team is determined during practice. It is during practice that individuals improve and teams are able to work on offensive and defensive strategies. It is your opportunity to work on the areas needing refinement after assessment of your most recent game. 
Due to our plane facilities, practice plans are modified to take into consideration the available plane area. Any quality coach understands the ebbs and flows of the seasons, the individual weeks within the season, and the daily practice. Having to modify practice planning to accommodate for limited, limited playing space directly results in modifications to the overall practice plans. A turf field would enable the coaching staff to plan around the needs of the team with regards to soccer techniques and strategies as well as conditioning rather than on what space will be available tomorrow for practice and how many modifications do we need to make our practice fields to make our practice field due to field constraints. And while I could sit up uh, here and uh, second every one of those things said, I would, I would rather take an approach that might not be spoken about quite as, mit, uh, as much, um, and that's kind of the role of sports within the community. Um, Durham is very much like uh, the community that I grew up in, uh, in uh, Cedarburg, Wisconsin, small town um, atmosphere, but a, a very engaged uh, community. And one thing that I see missing uh, in this community and that I had when I was growing up was just that, that environment to go on a Friday night, you know, at seven o'clock, the lights are on, and I was five, six, seven years old, and I said, wow, that's what I want to be when I grow up. You know, that's, and, uh, and that's missing here with a, with a world-class facility is the one we're proposing here. That's something where I know that I will take uh, tremendous pride in engaging the community, uh, getting families out to come watch our games, getting uh, you know, every generation of, of folks who are interested to come on out, uh, watch a game. Uh, right now, a four o'clock kickoff, everyone's still working. Families are not out able to, to really attend in those environments. And, and I know that uh, something like this, I, I can promise you I've got a little two-year-old at home. Uh, that's going to be an environment that I'm going to want to bring my, my family to, a uh, girls' soccer game, lacrosse game in the spring, boys' soccer game. Um, it's, it's, it's an environment that is going to create that next level goal for, for a player and uh, is certainly something that um, I'll be pushing hard for when we, uh, we pass this, uh, this initiative here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. To kind of, and, and Sid and Charlie both hit both key topics to this, not only from a functionality standpoint as being able to coach a team and much like a classroom, you want to have the tools necessary to educate the kids to maximize their growth in whatever sport it may be, uh, but also the pride factor, and Charlie did a great job touching upon that about being able to provide an environment similar to what we were lucky enough to experience with his boys soccer team and competing in the state semifinals at Stello Stadium in Nashua where we had upwards of 150 students come to the game at night to cheer them on with many community members uh, and then again at the state championship at Southern New Hampshire University where people had a venue to go to, a turf field that we knew the environment was going to be safe for the players, lights to keep the game in an evening environment conducive for more people to attend and then bleachers for upwards of 1,500 people to attend that game. So that is one thing we hope to bring with this project. Um, to touch upon Sid's notion real quickly, I wanted to visually show it as I think it helps sometimes. And, and this breaks down our usage in a practice day environment in the fall. And so it, it's kind of outlined where the light blue, although it's coming up on the screen a little differently online, you'll be able to clearly see the lines. Um, but essentially what this shows is I think our teams and our coaches do a phenomenal job using as much as possible from the resources that they're given. So we've got cross country teams that are using um, the base paths and baseball on some occasions. We're sharing fields. Our coaches do a phenomenal job of sharing space and making do with, with what they have. But truthfully, for the programs we want to have and expect to continue to have, we have inadequate facilities as far as resources and space is the key component with that. And this map gives you a great idea on a nice sunny day in September, our options. And when you take in some rain or when you take in certainly in the spring and we have some spring coaches to address those matters, this all goes away. We don't have those venues for practices. So you can only get so much done in the gymnasium for a practice environment. And truthfully, the drainage on the entire site is problematic. 
And the main reason that is the case is the ground is so hard here. When you can envision this entire environment, this was all built on fill from the Route 4 uh, project in building that. So it wasn't ideal soil at any point for this fields. But long and short, the wear and tear and the overusage of all of these fields over the last 30 to 50 years has created an environment that is not conducive for any growth whatsoever within your fields. And that truly comes into play when we look at the spring season. Um, in an ideal scenario, as an athletic director, when I speak to athletic directors across the state, they generally have at least one or two rectangular fields, similar to the ones we show up there, that have an off season. And what I mean by that is if they're a soccer field, they take the spring off so that they continue to grow and be vibrant again for that fall soccer season. Conversely, if you have a lacrosse field, you have the soccer season off in the summer to regrow grass in those areas so that it's, it's a field you can be proud of and a safe field for once that upcoming season begins. In our case, given our footprint, we don't have those luxuries. So a soccer season concludes Halloween. We are trying to get on that field as early as March 20th to start our spring seasons. And for everyone in, in New England, you can know March 20th, most of the time there's still that white stuff on the ground. And if not, it's, it's mud. So we are immediately put behind the eight ball because the need to use those same fields. Because as you can see with the diagram, again, similar to the fall, we try to maximize our areas of usage. And that's a great problem because we have such growth in all our sports teams. Our lacrosse numbers are up. Our soccer numbers are up. We've created unified soccer. Our track, indoor, outdoor, and cross country numbers continue to flourish annually over the four years that I've been here. So that's a great problem to have, to have that continued growth with your students wanting to be on a sports team and providing that extracurricular opportunity. Where it really starts to handcuff you is when your footprint doesn't grow. And unfortunately, given where we're located with Route 4 on one side, wetlands and UNH on the other, we don't have those opportunities. And the small field at the middle school is already being overused by the 100 plus middle school cross country and track athletes, the soccer, the middle school softball, the middle school baseball team. So our facilities really don't warrant the amount of participation we have. And we're, we're not in the business of cutting any of our sports teams. So we start to run in similar problems here with the lacrosse season, our baseball and softball season. As you can see, you know, the outfields, which you would hope would just be outfields for baseball and softball within their season, out of necessity to the 50 plus boys lacrosse um, student athletes and the 40 plus girls lacrosse student athletes, we need to use those spaces for practices. So really, unfortunately, no field is in an ideal state at any point over the 12 month window because of the over usage. Another tricky part about our, our current layout is if you can envision where home plate is of the baseball field, from that to the benches of the lacrosse field, it's about 20 to 25 feet, which obviously becomes an immediate hazard if you've ever been to a Fisher Cats game, high school game, Red Sox game, the amount of foul balls that take place throughout a game become a serious issue. And so because of that, we cannot have a baseball game and a lacrosse game happening at the same time. Uh, from an athletic director standpoint, you always want to over, overfill you know, facilities in the afternoon so that teachers, community members, school board members, they can all come out and watch multiple events happening at the same time. Unfortunately, our current environment limits, in fact, handicaps that completely, where we can't do that. And again, going back to the spring here in New England, having only grass surfaces and the weather being completely uncertain, like this past weekend, we only have a certain amount of days to play the lacrosse schedule and to play the baseball schedule. So once games start approximately April 18th to Memorial Day, every single day there is a game scheduled to avoid the conflict that we have with our eight home lacrosse games on the boys' side, eight home lacrosse games on the girls' side, and 16 home baseball games that we're trying to have. So it takes into consideration a lot of weekend needs and a lot of finger crossing, hoping that we don't get the rain that happens every April um, that shuts our fields down so that we don't have a venue to host games. 
and aren't faced with double headers on Saturdays or double headers on Sundays. Or in the case that we've had the last two years, we've had to move girls lacrosse senior day to Memorial Field at UNH. That of course we have to rent at a nominal fee, but it, it really is unfortunate we can't have their senior game be on their home turf as we've had to do this past year for girls, or excuse me, girls soccer as well, moving their last two home games. The last thing I do want to touch upon on this because I think it, it certainly is, excuse me, two last things, is the sun alignment of the field, which becomes a, a safety issue with their current alignment for a baseball game. If you can envision with my, bear with my artistic ability, but where the sun, sunset angle is, that sets approximately right behind home plate which can be a, an issue much like driving up Route 4 in the mornings. Um, you know, you're blinded by that, and that sets right behind home plate, which is probably the least ideal spot for a baseball configuration because that affects the most amount of players on a field playing the baseball game. Um, the new orientation that we'll get to shortly sh avoids that problem completely and sets, home, uh, sets the sun behind first place, uh, again, in minimal impact on a baseball field. The last thing I want to talk about, and I, and I know Todd kind of addressed this from the get-go, um, there's no ovals within this entire footprint. So the 100 plus middle school track athletes that we have, the 50 plus high school track athletes that we have that have had tremendous success through the years have never had a home here at Oyster River. I, and I know in years past this has really been promoted as a track project. And a large part of it is. But the reality is this is a facility upgrade for all our programs. And in the track specifics is we're not putting makeup on the scenario. We are creating a home track and field for our teams. And, and I think that is something that cannot be overlooked because our current scenario for those programs, and, and Todd will talk about it when he was a middle school coach, our current scenario is hallways, pavement, and approximately $4,000 a year in rental of the UNH facilities. Um, in my opinion, that is unjust for a high school to expect of their track and field athletes. It is something that is, needs to be brought to the community, and, and our kids truly deserve it. And the price tag of this project is a couple million dollars, yes. And, and there's a lot of great that comes with it, but it's not a couple million dollars for just a track. It's a couple million dollars for affecting every single one of our athletic teams, in addition to all the PE classes that would take advantage of all these venues. So again, the, to recap kind of my long-winded speech, this breaks down our fall and our spring usage. And as you can see, the overlap is about 99% of the area. So again, much like at home, if you stand in the same spot in your backyard, you're not going to have grass there in a couple days. And it's no different with, this, with an athlete with cleats on, um, taking part in a practice venue at their facility. So briefly, I want to talk about what we're currently doing to maintain what we have. I, I think it goes without question that although we're bringing a lot of awareness in regards to our facility and the concerns we have, it is important to note that we are trying to maximize and make do with what we currently have. And it's important for people to, I think, understand and appreciate all that's put into this. In the spring season, I just went chronological. Uh, as the coaches kind of alluded to, and I'll let the spring coaches kind of come up and talk on these matters since they're up, um, we allow limited usage, much like the fall, we can't get on the field until it's physically possible to get on that field where we can maximize the growth, the usage, the availability for the entire length of the season. In many cases, that's the first game. And, and for baseball and also for our lacrosse programs, that is the reality of it. And certainly for track and field, you know, they're needed to use hallways and then an all-away schedule. I, I touched upon the staggering of the home events. Um, we've had to rent outside of facilities, track, or excuse me, turf fields at UNH um, pretty regularly to make sure we get all our regular season and, and hosting tournament games in. Um, the maximization of the hallways and the gymnasiums, which is never conducive for any kind of practice environment or even safety for the knees and shins, of, it becomes an issue. And then we, our, our maintenance guys do a fabulous job making do with what they can with our current facility. Um, at this time, I'd like to bring up Kate Potvin, 
who's been with our girls lacrosse program for eight years, uh, also an alum of Oyster River. And after her, I'd love to hear from Jim Tebow, our JV baseball coach, to talk about baseball. Thank you. Um, I have nothing really new to say beside what, what Sid mentioned. Um, when I look at this, I it's staggering to me that we still have the same facility that we used when I was here. Um, I think one of the things that Casey and I really wanted to present was that we, as the lacrosse program, and like Corey mentioned, often have 40 girls in the gym in goggles and lacrosse sticks and trying to throw lacrosse balls. It's dangerous. Um, we can't run plays. We can't, we can't really practice. And very often, the first time that we see the field is our first game. And so I feel like we have a really high caliber level of athlete. And they're being asked to compete against people who have been on turf for weeks, um, if not months. Um, and so they're competing, and they're playing really well. But I feel like the, the program would just improve so drastically if they had the facilities um, to allow them to practice the way they needed to. Um, also, in terms of the baseball, we can't be on baseball. We can't play or practice when baseball's there because of the, the fly balls and accidentally people getting beamed in the head. Um, so, and again, the past two years, our girls have had to scramble, which is inconvenient for a lot of people. You know, buses have to get called. The buses can't take them. We've got to figure out how to carpool the girls from here on their senior game, which is where they want to be, and move them over to... UNH, so um, I definitely think it would just continue to build the programs. We have such great athletes, and for them to be able to play at that level and compete against teams, we've seen teams in the program in the where we play, they haven't had coach changes, but their programs have developed immensely. They have new facilities. They're playing on state-of-the-art facilities, and we just, you know, I think it would really benefit the whole program to have those facilities for us. Um, yeah, the biggest issue for baseball is the safety issue, um, clearly, as, as, as Corey has mentioned. But the, uh, anytime we want to try and do anything with hitting, um, we have to use the, the, the turtle. Otherwise, we're, uh, we're going to put foul balls into where other players um, uh, in other sports are participating. And the, uh, that sometimes is fine if you're just doing batting practice, but oftentimes you're trying to do game simulations and you completely take out the, a, a lot of scenarios when that uh, turtle has to get used. Um, but the biggest issue is the sun. Um, the, with the time of year we play, um, the sun is not at its peak like it would be in the middle of the summer, so it's a little bit lower. So by the time the fifth or sixth inning rolls around, if it's a sunny day, you can guarantee that the pitcher is going to have a hard time. They, oftentimes they've had to kind of stand looking at first base and if, catchers almost have to roll the ball back um, to them in the middle of a game that has happened um, more than one occasion. Um, throws down to second base. I have seen uh, shortstops have to literally duck out of the way because they lose the ball in the sun. Um, and uh, that, that's the, the biggest issue. Um, and you know, the, the last thing is the, uh, the preseason. Oftentimes, many years, we get one day on the field um, where uh, if it wasn't for uh, renting UNH, we, we would have literally had not had seen anything except the inside of the gym. Um, and to, uh, to have a turf field where you can basically brush the snow off like they do at UNH, um, that would allow us at least a few days to, uh, to be preparing. So, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you both. And, and, and that is one thing that, that Jim brings up that's a great point is with a turf field, although we wouldn't be doing batting practice on a field, with a track around it. it. It allows your opportunities, assuming the weather is warm enough to be outside. As he alluded to, you can plow it, and it melts extremely fast because of the black pebbles, uh, rubbers within it, that you can operate much like a gymnasium. However, the size of a gymnasium and the size of a turf field is drastically different. So from a, from a practice scenario, from a as a coach trying to educate and teach the fundamentals of the game to the students, the field would be used from every sports program, not just soccer and lacrosse and field hockey. Um, so moving along, after the spring, we, we move into the summer months, and Sid talked about this a little bit. And one thing that we've been 
having to do, forced to do in my four years being here is because of lacrosse is such a demanding sport on the surface of the ground with the cleats and the areas of usage, we've had to close the field, literally, from the last lacrosse game and try to do everything under the sun um, to get that field ready for approximately September 2nd or so for our season to begin hosting soccer games. That puts a tremendous burden on our programs that want to offer summer opportunities with our coaches, with kids in training and skill development without a place to go. And so the usage of our JV field and the outfield of our baseball field, and keep in mind those areas are already being overused with practice, become more and more used in turn deteriorating those facilities even more and more. And we've been lucky enough to use some of the fields in neighboring towns for some of those off-site facility trainings that we have. Um, but as a high school, much like this auditorium we're sitting in that is hosting plays and, and bands and concerts for everything for this community, you want your high school to be your focal spot for all your activities taking place. And it's no different for athletic teams. We want this to be the focal spot. We want the youth organizations coming here and the middle school teams coming here to use our facilities as the um, domain, if you will, for athletic achievement within the teams. Within the closing, I work with our facility department pretty closely. And again, we try to do everything possible to survive the field and the root of the grass so that we have it in the spring. There's certain areas over the last three years we've tried heavy seeding and it just hasn't come back in, in, in August. We have sprinkler systems set up out there because there isn't irrigation currently. Um, this past summer we spent over six thousand dollars in sod not including labor to fill in those trouble spots from the lacrosse overused season. Um, and Charlie will tell you, we put it in as fast as possible. We, we watered it as much as possible. And truthfully, I'm not optimistic it's going to survive through lacrosse season next year because of the usage this, this fall with our soccer season. Um, and when you get that much usage on a field and you just drive by and co-drive and you're not necessarily on the field, it takes tremendous wear and tear on the flat surface of a field. And we have no fields currently that have a flat surface. We have dips in each corner. We have swales in the middle of the fields. And, and again, to try to fix these problems, it, it takes a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of resources that I, I worry is an annual conversation we're having with the facility department. And again, just to make the fields as safe as possible for our student athletes to participate on. Um, and when we do have practices here, and again, the coach has kind of alluded to this, our tryout process is, is much more difficult. And I would say as a, as a math teacher, you know, you're required to teach math, but we can't give you any calculators or books because we've got such a minimal space that we can use, and in some cases, you know, evaluating 60 to 70 soccer players, um, it's very difficult to do so when we are handcuffed with our facility usage. So once the actual fall comes around, and again, I talked about keeping us off the field as much as possible, the, the real unfortunate part that comes into play is, is when it rains, because we are completely handcuffed to what we can do as a facility. We can utilize the gym, we can use the multi-purpose room, that is about the size of this stage, or we can look to cancel practice or rent off-site facilities. And UNH has phenomenal facilities um, but there's some stipulations that come with using those facilities. One, we can't be on any field or track at UNH when there's collegiate athletes out there. It's a recruiting violation with the compliance department of the NCAA. Two, it's at minimum $150 an hour to rent any facility over there, minus the track, which is about 105 So it's hard to forecast from a budget standpoint how often it's going to rain and how often we need a field. Um, but again, it goes back to what they were talking about is it's extremely inconvenient for everyone. 
So when you set a practice schedule, you hope to be able to stick to that for jobs, for parents trying to commute kids to and from everything. And when we have to cancel or move off site, it becomes a, a tremendous burden, not only on the coaches, but the student athletes and their time and the parents getting to and from. A turf field would eliminate that because I can tell you with certainty, when it's raining, when we have snow, I contact UNH to rent a turf field. So if we have that turf field in our backyard, we avoid that phone call, we avoid those concerns that come up because we now have that premier, safe, consistent environment to host those games. And, and certainly from a physical education standpoint for the classes to take advantage of a, a turf field and a track um, from a curriculum standpoint, they can expand immensely as they wouldn't be concerned about not being able to get outside and, and limited to only indoor activities throughout the year. So, the solution. Now the fun part. Now the fun part. And I know Todd wants to talk the first part, so I'll let him. Um, I, I asked Corey if he would allow me to interrupt here and, and talk about this component because this is the, the component that is pro probably most near and dear to my heart. I, I do, however, want to emphasize a point that has already been made. One of the things that I think people, um, when they hear the price tag of this project, they say, that's an awful lot of money for a track. And I agree with you, it is an awful lot of money for a track, but I can't emphasize enough, you're not getting just a track. You are getting turf field. You are getting a stadium with lights. You are getting a track. You are getting a reconfigured and improved baseball field. You are getting a reconfigured and improved softball field. So it, it is a complete athletic facilities upgrade. And so I think it's important that we characterize it as that. That being said, the issue that really drew me into this years ago uh, along with a, a close friend of mine who happens to be in the audience, John Parsons, who's, hi John, um, who is, uh, we were both coaching middle school track. We um, were always impressed the caliber of athletes that we have, the, the level of interest our kids had. But what stands out time and again is we're, we're doing it without any place to call our home. And so most of the kids that are competing throughout their four years at Oyster River High School or eight years if they competed at the middle school, and, and maybe 10 or 12 years if they did the uh, ORYA program as well, are spending their entire uh, life without a home facility. So what is, what is it we're trying to accomplish here? Uh, first of all, we want to get a six-lane uh, six track with eight uh, sprint straightaway lanes, okay? So that, that gives, um, so for, for the, the home stretch having um, hurdles, and the sprint events having eight home straightaway lanes to allow for you know, championship heats in those, and then six lanes all the way around. Um, we're looking to kind of have this be, uh, and we, our PE department is, is thrilled about this. They do a significant fitness and walking unit. It would be a major upgrade for them. Um, as Corey has already said, we're, we're already spending $4,000 a year to rent a place to go practice. Uh, and, I, and I can't emphasize enough how UNH has been wonderful with regards to allowing us to have access to a facility, but it's not on our schedule. It's on their schedule, and it, and it is virtually impossible to run a program. Um, it would be like trying to plan a wedding in your neighbor's yard. You know, it's like the same kind of thing. I mean, no matter how willing they are to work with you and say, sure, you can use it, you're not going to be able to use it on the times that, they, that, 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 that are going to be inconvenient for them. And that's kind of what we, we are, are left to do. So, that's something to keep in mind. So 4,000 bucks a year is spent on rentals. Um, it would create the, uh, the historic opportunity for us to actually host home track and field meets. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't help but throw in a plug for one of our current athletes who just made it to the National Cross Country Championships this past weekend. Megan Duty, our, our student school board rep, just came in eighth in the Northeast Regionals and is off to Oregon to compete in the National Championships this next, next weekend. Very exciting accomplishment. Again. That's an example of an athlete who deserves to have a home facility to compete on. Um, and um, so obviously hosting a home track meet is, is a point of pride, but it's also a, you know, it's, it's something that I think our, our athletes have, have certainly learned. The other component is the opportunity for a community use of the track. Uh, people, I think, in the, uh, in the community, um, Certainly the UNH is available, but certainly during the day, oftentimes parking is a real issue over there and access to the facility is, is challenging. Um, so we would certainly be encouraging community use of our facility, certainly Oyster River Youth Association, 
a number of uh, community fundraiser type activities could be hosted in that facility. Uh, Relay for Life comes to mind. Um, a, a variety of things, community-based use. Uh, the other component is its training area for all of our athletes. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that, yes, track is a sp sport that is in and of itself, but running is involved in, in many uh, uh, athletic activities. And certainly utilizing a track for training purposes is, is going to be of value to everybody. Um, and really, kind of the last thing which Corey mentioned earlier, just the number of kids that this would benefit. And these are just the, the, the uh, school-connected athletes, 120 at the middle school, 50 at the, at the high school, um, 40 give or take in the ORYA program. That's 210, and that's a, that's a conservative estimate. Um, and that's, that rivals just about any athletic program that we have in the district in terms of the number of kids that are involved and consistently are participating in it. So I'm going to give the mic back to Corey, who's going to talk about the other components of the project. The next component that obviously is, is crucial for the continued growth of our programs in a safe way, in my opinion, is the artificial turf field. And in the drawing, that is the green field lined within the oval. Um, in this plan, the artificial turf field would only be the rectangular field with inside the track. All the other components would be grass fields. However, um, it would be extremely upgrades from what we currently have for those fields. For a turf field, I can't stress it any more than just from a consistency standpoint, from a drainage standpoint, and from a, an athletic director standpoint of providing an opportunity you know is safe for the kids. And a perfect example, this past fall, we hosted Lebanon in the boys' quarterfinal game. And it had missed pretty heavily the night before and into the morning. And Coach Kroll and I were outside on that field for about four hours. Or at least I was out there for four hours. Maybe he was there for about two. But nonetheless, we were getting that field ready for the game using turfus which is a baseball diamond, dry dirt, that you use in the baseball diamonds. As you see the Red Sox when they prepare their field. We were using that because we had so much water in dirt areas. And that's not an idea when you're playing a soccer game. And I know both teams handled it very well and, and embraced it almost. But the reality of it is we were filling water areas and concerning spots with dirt on a grass field. In nine years, I've never had to do that before. Um, but the reality of it is we wanted the home game. We wanted it to be our game. We earned that. And the environment at our field, which didn't take on a lot of rain, almost jeopardized that for us because the drainage and the overusage of the field almost made it unplayable for us. Um, when you look at every state tournament at the NHIAA level or, or really any level, uh, and even collegiately and professional programs, it's not a surprise they've all moved to turf fields. UNH has pretty much done it with every athletic facility they have over there. Um, it is costs a lot of money, yes, it does. But the benefits of that completely outweigh that short-term expense for that facility. Uh, again, we addressed it a little bit, the physical education component with this facility. You know, it, it, it provides so much more opportunity, not just for our PE classes, but for any of our classes. Knowing they can go outside and have a facility that's dry or a track that they can use within somehow educating them outside the classroom is a tremendous opportunity for our entire community. Um, Todd alluded to it from a training standpoint, and I know our coaches have as well. Again, it gives you that consistent surface to be able to properly plan and execute a practice and a game scenario. The amount of money we would in turn save or reallocate is maybe a better word that we're currently spending within our district funds to provide and find that offsite facility for our teams. Um, that no longer is an issue for us. On the flip side to that, this field can now become a revenue generator for us. Um, I'm not sure if anyone drives down 125 in the evening, but Seacoast United has a facility in Epping that they use. Those lights are generally on past 10 p.m. every night with usage. Um, the demand to use a turf field is there. And it's not just a high school. It's with all these exterior programs that are happening that are renting facilities all across the state. So the potential, if our programs aren't using it, or the youth component or the community isn't, you know, this is a potential to generate revenue to offset another cost within our district. 
and certainly the potential for expansion, not only with our athletic offerings here at school, but the youth organization, the middle school, community outreach support. When you have a facility that you know is going to be a playable area to offer something, a, crosses and gets over a significant hurdle when trying to start something new. And so the opportunity for potential growth in any of our athletic offerings in any of those uh, groups is now a potential reality. You know, the, the best comparison I have, and Nick Scuderi from ORA was hoping to make it tonight to kind of talk about this, but the best scenario I can have to the to people here and, and watching at home, our gymnasium is one of the nicest gymnasiums in the state, much like our auditorium we're in currently. And when we're not using that gymnasium, it is used by ORYA every moment we're not using it. And the reason they can use it, one, they take care of themselves, they keep it clean, but there's no wear and tear to the floor. There's no wear and tear to the bleachers. And that's similar to a turf field. There's no real wear and tear to it as much as you use it over the given life of it. And so I would envision their athletic programs not only reallocating to utilizing this facility every moment we weren't, but also allow them to go to their, school, to their board at ORYA with the potential for expansion of programs. And so now we're not only providing more currently here at the high school, we're able to open more doors with all our youth in, in hopes of promoting more athletic or any kind of um, outdoor exercise. The reconfiguration of baseball and softball um, is kind of shown here in the drawings. As you can see, the reconfiguration of the baseball pits home plate where currently left field pole is, if you will. By doing this, it, this eliminates the concern of foul balls. Um, with the drawing and working with tie and bond, the right field line would be approximately 280 feet away. And we would adjust a 200, or 200, a 20 foot fence in that area to ensure no balls would be traveling onto that track, onto that turf field for any given moment. It wouldn't happen. By realigning home plates in softball and baseball, you are now also maximizing your current grass layout between the two fields. And, and the reason we wanted to keep the drawings of a soccer and a field hockey field here is we are now eliminating a lot of the current usage where we're playing in the dirt of the softball field and we're playing in the dirt of the baseball field. Because by shifting home plates as far away from each other as possible, you're now again maximizing your outfield and your space for all those non-sports within those seasons. By also reconfiguring these fields, and something that I know the teams would tell you, they're getting new fields. We are stripping what they currently have, we're leveling the fields, and we're building a new infield for both of them. That is, again, puts them in a new category of getting a new field so that we have it properly sloped for drainage, so that we have the proper top dressing soil, so that we have proper level outfields, and we have grass growing in those areas. Um, again, luxuries a lot of kids have at a lot of schools, and they take for granted because they have it. And, and I give our kids a lot of credit. They grin and bear it. They accept what we have here. And the reality as adults in the district, especially as the district athletic director, it's my job to advocate for more of that. And so I, I expect them, they should have more, much like any of our other teams and any of our organizations here at school. This gives those opportunities. This gives them new fields. This gives them a true backstop and viewing area for a softball game and viewing area for a, for a baseball game that we currently don't have right now. We currently are dodging foul balls or walking down the line of the baseball field so you can't really see things in the other corner. And so again, that, that is something significant to take into consideration, much like the solar orientation, much like the foul balls. They're getting new fields. And so that this isn't just a track and a turf field. This is brand new fields for all our sports programs. And I think that's really important to, to see. And so now Todd's going to talk about the process and the timeline of what we feel is realistic if this gets passed. So um, obviously we're going to talk in, in just a moment about the specific details of this proposal, but I wanted to kind of lay out the timeline of, of how this could play out. In the next month, it's now December 1 as we tape this, 
by the end of December, uh, the school board will be making its final determinations on what the warrant will look like for the upcoming season. So by the end of this calendar year, we anticipate a warrant article being proposed by the school board um, of somewhere around $1.7 million for this project. So that should be coming about uh, in, the, in the coming month. Between uh, now and February, um, the uh, uh, tie and bond working with, with uh, uh, myself and Corey will continue to uh, refine the project, get all the necessary permits in place. Our hope is that by February, uh, even, even before the bond is passed, we would be ready to put it out to bid so that the, we can get the project, literally potentially have the project out to bid before the vote takes place. Um, obviously, the vote has to pass in order for us to be able to do the project, but in order to speed the timeline along, we would be in a position to be able to do that in February if we get all those permits in place. Um, March 10th is a big day politically. That is the day of the district to vote. So March 10th is um, the day that we would hope that we could secure a 60% vote on the, the, the warrant for the athletic facilities upgrade. Again, because we're an SB2 town, uh, and because this is a, a, a financing article, it, it requires a higher majority. It, doesn't, it isn't a simple majority. A 60% vote of yes is required. So it's going to take some work to, to get there. And so we really want to uh, encourage everybody out there to, um, to really do what they can to help us get this done, because we do believe this is a very important need. Um, assuming that the vote is, is a yes vote on the Warren article, um, we would anticipate breaking ground probably just before April vacation of 2015. Um, now, that, uh, that will involve some uh, reconfiguration and, and, and moving around of spring sports for this upcoming season, but it's definitely, if it's in the interest of getting us a uh, stadium and, and turf field and so forth, uh, I guarantee you all of our programs are very willing to, to deal with one season of disruption if it means getting a... A, a, a top quality uh, athletic facility. And then hopefully, assuming the construction schedules are, are go as, as according to plan, by October, um, conservatively, we would be able to host home games in the fall of 2015. So uh, my wildest dream would be that I would be standing there, you know, maybe in October, watching Charlie and, and his team or, or Sid and her team out there on a tournament game. Um, you know, in, in the fall of 2015, It'd be a, a, really a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity for us to have. Um, now, I, one of the things that always comes up clearly um, when you're asking for um, a potential uh, a bond means borrowing uh, the district borrowing money, and so certainly there's a variety of scenarios that could play out. But we did want to at least begin to speculate as to what the financial impact of it might look like, assuming a yes vote. Clearly, again, as I said, the board still has to finalize what exactly their, their warrant is going to look like. But um, so assuming a 10-year bond on a $1.7 million rate, um, it would mean roughly, uh, you can see where they have the $200,000, the $300,000, the $400,000 home. And so for the average Lee resident, uh, it would be a, on a 10-year bond for a $200,000 home, it would be a $36 a year impact on your taxes. 54 if you're a $300,000 home and so forth. If you look in the middle column, it tells you the Durham impact. Uh, for Durham residents, it would be a $28 impact on a $200,000 home, $42 impact on a $300,000 home, $56 impact on a $400,000 home, and then Madbury, you see there, it's $30, $45, $40, and $60 um, for the, the same levels of homes. We've also provided, uh, in the event that the board decided to go with a 15-year bond, which is another possibility, um, and you can see the rates there. Obviously, it's a smaller impact because you're stretching the payment out over a longer period of time. Um, and just to explain um, why it varies from town to town, clearly there's a whole, a whole lot of variables that go into determining local tax rates. The school is only one of those. Um, obviously, property valuations and so forth play a big role in that. So the, there is a variability from town to town in terms of what, it would, would Im, what the impact would be. Go ahead. Next slide. Um, so really, that brings us to really the next piece. I, I'll turn this over to Corey to kind of talk about the next piece. So when talking with Dr. Morris and, and Todd and, and community members about putting this proposal forth, we, we really felt that 
we had to show the taxpayers of these communities, we do value your, your dollar. And so the entire project approximately cost between 2.4 and 2.5 million dollars. And with the 300,000 already privately fundraised through the efforts over the past few years with Fort, we didn't expect to go to the taxpayers for the remaining balance of that. What we wanted to go to the taxpayers were for was the bare essentials, if you will, to provide the opportunity for our kids. So the 1.7, in addition to the 300,000 already fundraised, covers $2 million, which covers everything we've talked about, excluding the lights, bleachers, dugouts, and a walkway pattern to come for parking and getting over to the facility. So I think it's a safe number, and we try to put our shoes as taxpayers in the towns we live in, is we're not asking for everything. I think it's a valid argument that this is a good investment to the taxpayers of these three towns. It's approximately a $2.5 million project. We're saying we'll privately fundraise $800,000 of that project. So over one third of the project privately fundraised in this day and age is a challenge that we embrace because we feel that is a strong signal that we're taking this very seriously. We take your money very seriously as taxpayers and in order to get this done, we gotta work together. And so we're not gonna overvalue the input from the taxpayer. We're gonna do a lot of work and hit the ground running to additionally fundraise to get everything to make this a complete package process, uh, project, excuse me. I know we touched upon a lot of those. A few things we didn't really touch upon was obviously the dugouts for baseball and softball and, and the bleacher system. Um, again, if you're, if you're lucky enough to go to a, an away game and support, o support Oyster River teams, whether it be Portsmouth or again, SNU or Stello Stadium this past couple weeks, you're going to a stadium. And, and speaking as a former student athlete, and if you talk to current student athletes, they know when they're going to those venues. When they go to a Kingswood, who has a turf field and lights and a gorgeous stadium, they know when they're going there. And, and that says something strong about the message they're sending from Kingswood to their opponents. And, and it has nothing to do with skill. It has nothing to do with championships. It has everything to do with the pride and the commitment of that school district providing that opportunity. And, and it's special when you go to games and you see community members come out who have no business or any connection with the boys soccer team and they're just there supporting the team. And as great as the intimate environment is for a home event here, whether it be soccer, baseball, lacrosse, the reality of it is we're really limited. We're li limited to standing room only and eight to 10 feet off the playing surface, which could be a potential hazard from a fan, especially in a lacrosse game, and it's, it's not conducive to connect to those younger families, as Charlie alluded to, bringing a two-year-old to a game, making it a Friday night event to, as the school to embrace that as a community and come to it, much like we just did with Almost Maine, a great play performed last weekend here. It was a Friday night event. People could come out and see it. And it, for athletics, I want to have that. We, I think the kids deserve to have that so that they have that venue where all their student athletes or colleagues can come and parents and alumni. And by ha providing the bleachers and providing the lights, we're able to really finish this project off immediately the way it's intended to be completed. Um, from an engineering standpoint, I can tell you the lights especially, the pre-work for the wiring and the conduit that would take place under the drainage of the turf field. A lot of that work would be worked out in the initial drawings. So it's not to say if we didn't fundraise all the money necessary on March 10th or April 1st that we couldn't proceed with those projects. Yes, there is a chance we could do them later on. But I think to embrace this as a community and embrace individuals to get behind it and vote for it and, and connect with people who want to financially support this above and beyond, now's the time. And now's the time to really educate everyone on the project at hand. So this is where we reach out to all of you. And how can you help and what do we need from everyone who wants to help behind this project? Spreading the word is obviously, word of mouth is the most powerful tool when marketing comes into play. And in, in these three towns, it's no different. 
I, I'd encourage people to reach out to myself, Mr. Allen, uh, the website we've created, to get all the details. If someone's unfamiliar of this project, and maybe your neighbor, if you're watching this, maybe they're unfamiliar. Maybe they don't have students in the school district, and they wonder why $36 a year for 10 years is a good investment. Have them contact us. Have them go to the website. Have them see the testimonials we're going to be putting up there from students to talk about the value of this, the value of the um, facilities that can really enhance their environment of their, hopefully, you know, middle school through high school through youth days using these fields. Obviously, we have opportunities to make a donation. If you're inspired through this talk tonight, hopefully it's probably Todd's words, but if you're inspired through this talk and you want to make a donation, we'll happily take that and put it towards the fund already exi um, existing the, through the F Athletic Facilities Upgrade Project to offset that cost. But I think one that's, that we're really going to push, and, and in my four years of being here, of getting to know Todd and Mr. Parsons, who are the, you know, the initiators, if you will, of this project multi years ago, there's a lot of great people in town and a lot of great alumni that have donated to this cause. And it's sitting in an account that's upwards of $300,000 currently. And we don't want to ask you to donate another dollar. We really don't. Ideally, you don't want to, and we can get money from someone else to do so. So what we're kind of challenging is pledge a certain amount of dollars so that as an individual, I will pledge to give X amount of dollars to this project when it passes on March 10th. So we're not asking for a check now, and we're not necessarily, hopefully, we're asking for a check in general. But we got to prove to these supporters this is going to pass. And, and, and I think Todd and I and the coaches and the community members we've talked to feel extremely passionate this is going to pass. There is more than 60% that want this. And so we're asking people that they can go online again and, and pledge a dollar amount to this process once it passes. And then we can happily call you on March 11th and work out some kind of um, arrangement to get together and, and put your donation you want to put to great use for this project. And then lastly is obviously volunteering to assist in this marketing and promotional effort. Um, you know, Todd and I are, are going to be in the forefront of this, obviously speaking about it. But we really encourage others, if you want to be a part of this and help us and connect with the project, please do so. Please come out. Please reach out to us. Um, the more the merrier. And all hands on deck approach is certainly the one we're trying to go for. So how do you do so? So recently, we've been able to set up, and fortunately, the domain name was still there. So we've got www.orbobcats.com. This site, it will be exclusively for educating and putting all our documentation and put this video on there and information about how to donate and what it means to you. We're going to have the tax, um, the bond impl implica uh, implication, geez, Louise, implications, thank you. Uh, we'll have that on there, as well as any information we can have about this project. I know the, the turf fields in general was a hot topic a couple weeks ago in an NBC piece. We're going to have literature on the website about that. I, our hope is that we can educate everyone in these three towns as much as possible so that they feel confident in the decision they're making on March 10th. And, and I think if we can get all that information out there to you and uh, it isn't something someone buy, buys into, that's okay. There's no problem with that, but we feel confident if the message is out there and consistent that we're going to get over that 60%. Um, so I thank you very much for your time. I know I'm extremely long-winded, but clearly we're both pretty passionate about this. And Todd, would you like to say a few words to finish up? Oh, I hope people have any questions. If they would like to yes. Start. Are there any, t any questions about this project people would like us to address that we haven't already done so? Don't be shy. I can tell we have a very supportive audience here, so I do, I do appreciate that. Again, uh, if you do come up with questions, uh, there is a link on orbobcats.com where you can send an email to our fine athletic director, Corey Parker, with any questions you might have. Direct those uh, to him, and we will get you answers as quickly as possible. But again, thank you, everybody, for being here. And like I said before, my fondest dream is to stand on the, the athletic turf field next October and watch a, a home uh, soccer game take place. So uh, hopefully we can all get there and, and, and it'll be a, a great facility once it's completed. Again, thank you everybody for being here.